the Pueblo Gegenda, do you have any add-ons? I have something I'd like to add on. Yes. I just would like to talk about um, lighting at the Canada Post mailboxes at La Trisin in Tuskegee. Okay. I don't uh, know where. Go to, uh, Ten, ten D? Sure. Ten E, I'm sorry, ten E. Ten D. Anything else to add? Yes. I, I have a financial request. request okay, financial please. request? Please. Yeah. Community grant. Yep. And we'll go to 12B. 12B. Please and thank you. Motion to accept the agenda. Second. As amended. As amended, yes. All those in, in the favor of the vice saying aye. 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 Motion carried. I'd like to add on that uh, we have regrets from uh, Councillor LeBlanc, Councillor Murphy, and uh, Ward News. Uh, any conflict of interest uh, declarations? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll proceed. And we'll proceed to the presentation from WSP, Land Use Bylaw and Municipal Planning Strategy. And I know your first name is Anne, so I'll say Anne, you're on. Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you, Council. My name is Anne Winters. I'm a community planner at WSP. Um, and I'm here today to present the draft documents for the Municipal Plan and uh, Land Use Bylaw. Um, I guess before I start, there were supposed to be three of us uh, presenting today. Uh, the three of us did, there, were, there was myself and two of my colleagues, and we did do work on various pieces of the two documents. Unfortunately, one got uh, pulled away with a scheduling conflict, and the other actually got, um, uh, fell ill this weekend. So anyway, you're stuck with me. So, uh, so I'm going to be presenting, uh, give a general overview of the project, uh, present to you the outcomes and some and some key changes that we did to the documents um, and then answer whatever questions we have as best that I can um, these are just something to keep in mind that these are draft documents and this is part of the process of fine-tuning and getting the documents to where we want to be before the formal uh, public participation process and and uh, and adoption process. So um, yeah, I'm, we're here, I'm here to, to listen to your feedback and to start a discussion on, on changes that we'd like to see or uh, answer any concerns that you may have. Which I guess kind of brings me into my next slide. Uh, so the intent of tonight's presentation is again, I'm going to be presenting the project overview and outcomes. I'm here to collect input and feedback from council and do, do we have members from PAC? Is the, yes. Okay, hi. Nice to meet you, okay. Yes, yeah, so to uh, collect input uh, from council and PAC on the draft documents and um, discuss and provide insight on um, dra the draft documents prior to the formal public participation process and uh, adoption process. So I think some of you have seen this slide before. We were here in the fall to give a bit of an overview, but uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with what a planning framework in the province of Nova Scotia looks like, uh, we have it up here. So at the top, we have the Municipal Government Act, which is a piece of provincial legislation that um, essentially obligates municipalities to have what is called a municipal planning strategy or an MPS. This municipal planning strategy, um, it's a document that's very visionary. It has goal settings, it has policies um, that are meant to guide council towards achieving those goals and the vision that's set for the community. Uh, the document has what we call designations, and these designations generally show uh, how land use should be used. So they'll show generally where residential should be put, or industrial lands, or where uh, environmental protection measures should be. From the municipal planning strategy, we have what's called a land use bylaw. <clears throat> and these land use, this land use bylaw get, really gives the, the policies in the uh, municipal planning strategy regulate, or teeth, uh, gives them implementable teeth through, the, through regulations. And these regulations are often found in what we call zones. So while the MPS does have uh, overarching designations, uh, showing generally where residential could be. The zones will specifically show 
this is where multi-unit uh, residential shall be, and it shall be built this way, this high, this large. It shall be set back so far from the road. So the land use baller is really the, the teeth that uh, implements the policies that are put in the MPS. And then kind of alongside what the land use bylaw, we have what are called development agreements. <clears throat> so development agreements are enabled through the MPS, um, and they are a way to give um, the municipality and the applicant a bit of flexibility uh, to start negotiating with the more possibly contentious, more contentious land uses or more problematic land uses or the larger scale land uses. Uh, are, are, could look like. So development agreements will start with the municipality and the applicant negotiating some of the aspects. Then it, these development agreements will go through PAC to review and then uh, council. So development agreements kind of sit alongside the land use bylaw. So WSP's project was to review the MPS and land use bylaw documents that you currently have in place uh, to upgrade them and refresh them and give a bit more clarity. So quickly on how did we get here. So we started, WSP started the project by engaging with the public and stakeholder. And I think we are up here end of October, beginning of November uh, to do that. Kind of alongside as we were doing that, we were developing uh, research topic memos. Uh, so we did five memos on areas that, um, that would help inform the kind of the best practices and what other municipalities are doing in certain aspects of, of the plan or man, land use bylaw. Uh, then we started preparing the first draft of the two documents, and that was really over December and January. <clears throat> then we circulated these two drafts to staff for internal comment. Uh, that came back to us. We did some minor adjustments and tweaks, and it would, then it was distributed to you uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, tonight is where we are here. I'm presenting the drafts to council and PAC. Um, and so then after tonight, uh, I, mean, I guess it's, it's at to council's discretion how you want to uh, continue. Do you want to open up a formal public participation process for the, for the documents? Um, uh, and this, if so, you'll have to decide with staff what that might look like. Uh, and then the formal approval through formal approval process through council, and then eventually uh, ministerial approval will will commence. Uh, so quickly, who did we talk to? So we were we made a couple trips up here. Uh, we did a few workshops, and we met with municipal staff. We met with a couple of councillors. Uh, we met with community stakeholder groups, and we also held um, for what we call tactical engagement sessions. So we set up little engagement booths where we know um, foot there is naturally high occurring uh, foot traffic, uh, to, and we were there to really intercept people that were go walking by. So we would grab people and say, hey, what do you like about your community? Uh, what would you like to see more of? So between those four, we have over 100, but I would say it was closer to 150, maybe more. We, we intercepted a lot of people um, during those events, and we were very well received. We got lots of uh, glowing reviews from the community, from the residents, so it was nice to hear. And then we also had an online survey that was open for about five weeks, uh, and from that, we had 114 responses from residents. <coughs> so, our project objective, like I said, we were, um, our mission was to renew and update your current plan and land use bylaw, but to also provide some clarity and consistency between the two documents, between the plan and, and your zoning regulations. So there's a number of benefits. I have my printed off version here and I'm losing. Using track. So there's a, a number of benefits uh, for having a clear and concise planning framework. It's, it's, it's very important to have uh, the two documents work hand in hand with each other. Um, so some of the benefits uh, are that it increases the, increases the consistency and the administration, that's an administration time uh, that staff have to go through to interpret a certain policy or to enforce a certain regulation. So if you have uh, two clear uh, and consistent documents, it takes staff a lot less time and effort to, to go through and, uh, and enforce them. It also makes the process simpler, more fair and consistent for applicants. It provides for 
predictable development patterns so you know which areas of land are meant to be used for what. Um, it builds resiliency for future and unknown events. So for an example, in our land use bylaw, you now have a floodplain zone. So that floodplain zone has regulations um, that will help build some resiliency and protection on the current development uh, should a 1 in 50 year or 1 in 100 year flood, flood occur. And then it also gives the municipality the tools and flexibility to respond to a changing economy, a changing housing market, uh, changes in population, as well as those uh, natural environment events that, that we're seeing more frequently of and more severely. So the goals of the uh, of the municipal plan bless you of the municipal planning strategy were were updated and uh, they were updated using all of the engagement uh, that we did speaking with councillors speaking with staff stakeholders and members of the public <clears throat> so these goals are listed here uh, that we came up with five of them and we're gonna I'm, for, for the next little bit of the presentation I'm going to spend some time going through each of the goals and presenting some of the changes that we did to the two, two documents and how they are reflected into each of the five goals. Um, but in short, the five goals that we came up with uh, were to increase the diversity and resiliency of the local economy, to increase the diversity of housing options across the municipality, to foster an active and accessible community for all ages and abilities, to protect and enhance the natural, cultural, and built heritage, and to foster resilient, sustainable, and distinct communities. So getting into the first one, this was to uh, diversify and have a local economy <coughs> that is more resilient. So a couple of things that we did to, that are reflected in this goal. So we reckon in this new draft version, we recognize, we wrote policy and preamble to recognize and support local commercial hubs. So currently your MPS, it does, uh, it does pay homage to, I think, the business park and industrial zones, but it really paid little attention to the importance that uh, the local commercial uh, services and amenities play in the community. So places like Shop of Carl or Carl's Store, <clears throat> those are vital assets for the community, but the the plan, the current plan doesn't really uh, pay the respect that those, that those assets have in the community. So we wrote a little preamble, um, talked about the importance of building those commercial hubs and, and creating, um, I guess, supporting local commercial um, growth and, and building those hubs so that people can come and do their banking or do their grocery shopping or whatnot. Uh, we also introduced new reg regulations for new industries, such as aquaculture and cannabis production. <clears throat> we introduced new gastro-tourism opportunities, so we now have uh, patios are permitted in restaurants, and evening patios are also, uh, uh, establishments can also apply for evening patio license as well, so anything that, the patio to be open past 9 p.m. is also available, um, as well as breweries and distilleries. And then another thing that we did is that we, we directed industrial uses to industrial locations. Um, currently, your plan and bylaw, I think it's more your bylaw, um, you allow for um, industrial uses as an, as an accessory use to a residential property. And as applicants become down the line and, and try to get their permits, it becomes what's allowed in, in your uh, in your bylaw conflicts with the National Building Code and then there's some, there's some conflictions and um, it can, gets a little confusing. So we did some work to make uh, those regulations more consistent with the National Building Code. So by directing the industrial uses to the appropriate locations. Okay, goal two, to increase the diversity of housing options across the municipality. I would say in speaking with people from the municipality, this is probably the most commented theme um, of, uh, that we heard. It, was, it probably came out as the strongest. Um, so a couple things that we did, and I have a few items, that, a few slides to address this. 
Uh, but one of the first things we did is we gave clarity on lot requirements and permitted uses for multi-unit dwellings. Um, currently, if someone wanted to build a multi-unit dwelling in the municipality, it's, it's not clear on what the lot requirements are. And sometimes that can be a deterrent for if someone wanted to come in and it, it just seems confusing. It, it, can, it can be a deterrent for, for coming in to do that. So we gave some clarity on, um, on lot requirements and, and what it is you can build and, and what you need as, in terms of uh, lot space or frontage um, and whatnot. We also gave permission for more diverse housing forms like group dwellings and townhouses. So I'm sure most of you know what a townhouse is or what a townhouse looks like. Uh, we have a couple images up here that, of what more rural um, townhouses could be like. Um, group dwellings, for those of you who don't know what a group dwelling is, it's kind of a new trend that's been emerging. Uh, a group dwelling is ha if you have one large property and you have multiple units on that one large property, and each unit have shared um, amenity spaces, what it could be in the front, it could be kind of like a backyard setting. Uh, they often share driveways and share parking spaces. Um, they can be sold off as condominium or used as rental. Um, so you now have, they're becoming more and more popular, um, and you now have a section in your land use bylaw that allows someone to come in for, uh, to build uh, group dwellings through site plan approval. The, the site plan approval gives a more prescriptive way um, of how these group dwellings should look. Um, we have some architectural requirements to really pay homage to the rural and country feel, um, and how the amenity space should be designed. Do they yeah. still have a development agreement when it comes to that? Or not really? Would that allow them as of right? Uh, no, it's through site plan approval. So uh, site plan approval, so it, it, it's not a development agreement. Uh, you, site plan approval is there are, there are more steps or there, there are more requirements for you to meet than just an as of right. Uh, so we have, it's, it's more design standards. Sure, but they can, yes, yeah, so the, that application can go through with staff and staff can, can work with the applicant to get, get, to get their permits that they need. So it's a little bit more restrictive than as of right, but it's not to the extent of going through a development approval. Okay, so um, goal two, carrying on. Uh, so we have permitted four unit dwellings in all residential zones. So currently your land use bylaw uh, kind of hops around from you can do up to three in this area, you can do up to four in this area. Um, we really didn't see the rationale behind three versus four, so we just put four units. Uh, you're permitted up to four units as of right in all residential zones. Um, we introduced clear policies to go through development agreements for m larger multi-unit dwellings. So if you want to build more than four, and I think it's up to 24, uh, you have to, you then, you can do that, but you can, you then have to go through the development agreement process. So that'll get negotiated with staff, uh, PAC will then review, and then council will, will also have an opportunity to review. We introduced accessory dwelling unit permissions in all residential zones, so that's our secondary suites. So in all residential zones, you're now allowed to have what, we, what are often referred to as a secondary suite. So that enables if there's, um, if there's in-laws that are they're growing older and they're, not ready, they're ready to downsize but not yet ready to live in a senior's <coughs> home, um, people can now have a secondary suite where in-laws can come and live on your property. It also provides residents with an additional uh, income rental, uh, an additional income through rental. So that's, um, that's a really, the, the secondary suites is a really uh, great way to, um, to, to provide that additional housing diversity in, in communities while keeping the respect, um, the respective character of the community. Uh, we've also introduced dwellings as accessory uses to other uses. So if someone had a commercial space or an industrial area or industrial space, they can now have, say, a bunkhouse or they can now have a, a living arrangement on that property. Whereas right now, if they had that, it's technically illegal. So we've now made it legal. And then we provided policy and direction to encourage new housing nearby the amenities and services. So we're, we have uh, 
policy that encourages building on those commercial community hubs and, and putting the higher density uh, housing developments near where existing shop and shops and services are or will be. Okay, so goal three was to foster an active and accessible community for all ages and abilities. So we introduced policies to support and encourage the use of active, active transportation throughout the community. Um, active transportation came out quite strong in our online survey results, so um, we wanted to make sure that there are policies to encourage and support uh, the use of active transportation. Uh, we recommended future projects to investigate community-based ride sharing, so whether that's a car share program or a carpooling program. Uh, what uh, we were recommending for the municipality to look into uh, projects that doesn't necessarily require residents to have their own personal motor vehicle to, to get from point A to point B. We recommended adoption of provincial accessibility standards. So these are coming, they're starting to get rolled out. Uh, we're not sure when they'll come as a, as a full set, but we've written a policy to recommend that once they do come out, that the, that the municipality adopts them. We emphasize accessibility and age-friendly needs in the transportation network and public spaces because we want uh, residents of all ages and abilities to enjoy the, the public spaces and to be able to, to move, move around the community. So the fourth goal, protect and enhance natural, cultural, and built heritage. Uh, so one of the things we did was we implemented lighting standards in our land use bylaw to maintain the dark skies designation. Uh, so as part of that, we have rules about how the lighting can, should be projected. So they should be projected downward. And this is a first for me, but we wrote regulation to, uh, to I guess, restrict lighting in the quantitative sense to the number of lumens that are permitted on a property. But um, so yeah, all of these done to, to respect and make sure that the dark skies designation is, is respected. <clears throat> uh, we create and we've created a policy to create and maintain collaborative partnerships with neighboring municipalities and volunteer organizations to provide open spaces, trails, and recreation areas. So to work with um, to work with uh, neighboring municipalities to not only get a uh, trail or open space network through the community, but also beyond. We also introduced policy to complete a subdivision bylaw. So subdivision bylaws can be really useful tools to, um, to start acquiring parkland acquisition. So, um, and also, so as people start to subdivide, they need to either, well, I guess it will be up to you, but oftentimes it'll be paying a um, cash in lieu for parkland acquisition, or it could be designating a, a certain area um, in the community as parkland. So this tool is really useful to, for realizing the, the open space um, and parkland network within your community. It also will help with um, keeping lakefronts open to the public. So as lakefront properties start to become subdivided, you, you'll then have a tool where you can say, um, at, with every subdivision, we have this we have an ability to, to ensure that there's a portion of a lake that is, that is um, kept open to the public. Uh, goal four, this is continued. So we wrote policy to continue to support natural built and cultural heritage through the support of facilities, collections, and programs of local museums, archives, and historical societies. Uh, we also wrote uh, policy to recognize and promote the use of bilingual services within the community. Um, currently, your plan doesn't really do that. It doesn't pay respect to the, to the French language or the Acadian language in the community. And we thought that um, as a cultural identity and a significant piece to the community, it, it's, worth a, it's worth a policy. Uh, we introduced tourism uses and museums in the marine industrial zone to highlight and share the traditional working waterfront landscape in Argyle. So um, you're now able to have a, a museum to highlight the, the industry as well as um, per, uh, boat tours. We're now allowing uh, tourists to do boat tours in, in this zone. 
And then the last goal, <laughs> to foster resilient, sustainable, and distinct communities. So we introduced floodplain protections to restrict certain types of development and require a floodplain study to acquire permits. Um, so this was the this is the floodplain zone that we that we wrote in to um, to the bylaw, um, and really it, it just protects future current and future development from um, potential impacts of, of future flooding events. We updated coastal wetland zone to reflect current provincial forestry and wetland information. So this is really just a map layer. Uh, the province updates it every year, but it's now reflected in the in the maps of on your in your land use bylaw. And we introduced and maintained permissions for renewable energy uses. So you now have more permissions for things like solar farms or wind farms. Uh, we introduced riparian buffer areas to limit development impacts on water courses. I know this is something that we want to talk about tonight. Um, so I have a slide and I'm, I'm prepared to talk about the benefits of them. Uh, so maybe I'll leave that to the end. Um, we wrote policy to encourage a diversity of multiple, multiple unit dwellings, so, more, so higher density dwellings, uh, around these local commercial, commercial hubs where existing shops and services are currently are. So that's really just building and, and encouraging that complete communities that live, work, play, shop uh, type of communities. Um, so that the people, the larger uh, developments that may come to the community, they're directed or encouraged to be directed closer to the, uh, to the shops and services that are here. Uh, and that kind of leads into my last point. Uh, so this, we wrote policy establishing the importance of local commercial hubs to the region. So those are the five goals and some of the changes that we did to reflect those five goals. Uh, we also had uh, four individual requests that we thought it would, it, this would be a good time to, to highlight to you all. Um, so I'll just go through them. The first one is a property, and I guess I should say that this practice is typical with these, uh, with these uh, bylaw drafts. If there are individual requests that are kind of a no-brainer or easy to do, then, then this is the time that is a, it's a great time to, to incorporate them into the, into the new documents. So the first one um, is in Tuscott. We rezoned uh, the property from mixed use to light industrial. And this request was made by the applicant to enable a micro cannabis production facility. And we did it. Um, it's included in the current draft that you guys have seen. Uh, because, and we did it because the adjacent property is also light industrial. And because of where it was, it just, it, it seemed to make sense. There really didn't seem to be a reason to not um, to not rezone it. There is a, another request came right at the end of Morris Island Road. We rezoned the, the property from coastal communities. So I guess that would, it's technically now a general use uh, zone into the coastal community industrial. Uh, and that request was made to allow for a boat shop. And it is also, this request has been inc included in the current draft because it is a large lot, and um, it is a generally uninhabited area. So uh, the boat shop, whatever noxious uh, uses could come from the boat shop, really won't impact um, neighboring properties. Um, OK, and then the third one. <clears throat> so that was in Lower West Pubnico. Uh, it's currently in the mixed use zone. A request was put forward to allow for a micro cannabis production facility that's it's currently on operation but doesn't have a permit. Um, we we are rec so this request came in I think just last week, um, so it's not been included in your in the draft documents. And we are recommending on adding a site specific in text amendment to into the approved document. So the property it is a large property. Uh, the micro cannabis production, the really where it is, it, 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 it's not near uh, residential properties. It, it, there really doesn't seem to be an issue on, on having that use. It's just currently not permitted in the mixed use zone. Uh, so yeah, we are recommending on adding a site specific in text amendment to approve the document. 
Uh, and then the last one is on Dontremont Road in Lower West Pubnico. <laughs> so this request was to be rezoned from mixed use to marine industrial, and it's to, it was to enable a lobster holding facility. <clears throat> so um, we are proposing that this request should be made as a separate application and have a little bit more consideration from staff as to whether or not should be um, allowed. And, <clears throat> and really, we just think that probably a little bit more, so, so the, just to back up a little bit. Uh, so the lobster holding facility, it is, the property is in relative close proximity to uh, residential areas. We understand that this use has had some issues in the past. So we just think a little bit more um, consultations to the nearby residents should be made before this, uh, before this is, property is formally rezoned. So uh, maybe a mail out might be useful. So I have a couple slides on some feedback that I know we've heard so far. Um, but I guess at this point, I would like to open it up for discussion. I am here to hear your comments and discussions, and I'm going to do my best to try to answer what I can. Um, if there are questions or issues that, uh, that I can't specifically answer, I'll, I'll go back to my colleagues, and we'll make sure that you guys have the answers that you need prior to uh, formal the formal public participation processes and, and adoption processes. So. Um, so I know riparian buffers were something that uh, were of concern. So I, I'm not gonna read this all, but this is the clause that we've written into the land use bylaw. And essentially what we're saying is where there's any active water course, so a river, stream, lake, uh, we're requiring a 25 foot buffer to be undisturbed. Uh, from, from development. So riparian buffers are, are very common practice. Any municipality with a relatively updated bylaw generally do have riparian buffers because they are, they are best practices for environmental protection. Riparian buffers help to <clears throat> control, do sediment, control sediment from leaching into the watercourses. Uh, the trees and brush help to keep the stream cool, so it helps to keep that, that habitat um, constant or, or, or protected. Um, they also, riparian buffers also help with uh, on-site on -site sewage um, septic systems. So where there is a field, so you'll have your septic system and where there is a field to do almost like the secondary treatment, those riparian buffers also help to leach out any contaminant uh, before it, before it, the, the discharge reaches the, the water course. Um, so at the 25 feet that, that we're suggesting is on like the more bare minimum end. Um, many municipalities have 20 to 30 meters of riparian buffers. So um, we, we put this in because it is a best practice to have them. Um, they offer a lot of benefits to the immediate property and the water course that runs through it, as well as uh, downstream water courses as well, as well as the species that rely on them. So that's, that's why they're in there. Um, I know it's something that we probably want to talk about a bit more, but so I'm happy to hear and discuss. Are you ready for questions? Sure. Right this point? Sure, yeah. You if you're ready? Yeah, yes. So you say it's a, a practice. Uh, where does 25 feet come from? Because I, I understand the Department of Environment for the province has regulations that you have to abide by. They don't have no, from what I could find, they have no vegetation buffers unless it's mining, forestry, some agri agricultural yeah. applications. But there's not a province-wide. You're, you're correct. So there's not a province ride wide on development. There is um, a requirement on industry, so on forestry. Uh, they have requirements for riparian buffers. Uh, but the province does not have a requirement onto municipalities to enforce a riparian uh, buffer. So the 25 feet, uh, I, I, to be honest, I'm not sure where the tw specifically where the 25 feet comes from, but I do know it's on the more the lower end of the, what would be appropriate. What would be expected? As you know, Argyle has hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of shore frontage of lakes and, and ocean front. Yeah. In my poll, and people aren't happy with that. <clears throat> 
you have a piece of property you invest in situations now going over a hundred thousand dollars I can't see why somebody would want to have a buffer of 25 feet of alders and blackberry bushes when it's been going common practice for years and years and without problems that I know because if there is the Department of Environment gets involved with their hay bale barriers and whatever you have to put in place I can't see where this this has to be in there um, I just don't see the need for it because it's who and who's going to police it the provincial department of environment is not going to police it for us no nope. we don't have the manpower with thousands hundreds and hundreds of kilometers and I see down below where you do selective trim and who's the person that's going to come and say you can cut that tree, but not this tree. How is that going to be enforced? I mean, to me, it's a municipal nightmare. Sure. So the riparian buffers will this this clause will serve as the other clause, like other clauses in your bylaw. It's for enforcement. It'll be complaint driven. So um, I, you, I guess. It, the enforcement is if your neighbor or someone sees you clearing closer to the lake than you should be, then they call the municipality and and then it goes through there, just like any other any other issue in the bylaw. So was there any, uh, if I may, was there any consultation with, with developers? Like we have several developers that take large tracts of land, turn them into lots for lake development or ocean development. Um, I mean, that's gonna make the lots very, especially for foreign buyers, unattractive for resale, if that's, in my mind, and several other people think the same way, if, if that's implemented into place. Yeah, so I guess just with the, sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so with these properties, we're not restricting development on the property, the whole property itself. It's really just trying to restrict oh, the 25. Oh, I understand that, but people may not buy, and probably won't buy in a lot of cases, if if they got to leave 25 feet of blocking their their view, which is the main reason they would want to buy the land start, that's an opinion. Sure. So, mm -hmm. I I don't think it's in there. It should be in there myself. Sure. If, until the province mandates it, that's yeah. my opinion. Anybody else wish to comment? I just just had a question of clarity on the the riparian. Um, it's on all courses of water, including ocean, correct? Or is it just rivers? Lakes? No, ocean would be coastline. So you're you're that there's no twenty five foot requirement on ocean. That would only be river and lake. Um, and streams. as far as I know, I believe it would be rivers, lakes, and streams. Okay. You, you just, you just the, believe. I believe, yes. So don't make any, so uh, let yes. me go back to get the answers for you. Yes. Uh, m a lot of your coastline, though, is has a um, coastal wetland zone on it, uh, which has its own development restrictions. So whatever, so, so that, and I don't believe that has changed much from what you have now. Uh, but on the maps, you'll see a coastal wetland zone, and, and that really, very little can be developed in the coastal wetland zone. So and that would be following that. And our neighbor municipality of Yarmouth, I believe, has that in their bylaws, and it's blatantly being mis misused. I mean, it's not being enforced. And mm -hmm. So, just a comment. Oh, well, all I can say is that it would be, it's a tool that the municipality would have to enforce if, if necessary, if it was to be necessary. Any other comments uh, from anybody? Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you. Um, I'm all for uh, by, bylaws, and uh, I looked over, read over a lot of the bylaws and all that. A lot of it is good, um, most of it is good, I think. But I honestly think, though, too, a bylaw or a rule or whatever, um, there has to be some give and take sometimes. And I know I copied down here, like land use bylaws are the teeth to these documents and all that. But at the same time, I feel as though if we're 
We want to be a welcoming municipality. We want people to come in. We want people to build. We want businesses to open up. We want to thrive. There has to be some give and take sometimes in some of these. You know, that you can't have somebody going out from municipal office, I don't think, with a sheriff's badge on saying, we'll see who I'm going to catch today for breaking the bylaws. Like, you know, it's that's my version of it anyway. It's There has to be some give and take sometimes. Sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and we understand the, the want and the want to be an attractive municipality to come build. Um, we've written the bylaw in a permissive manner. Um, we think we've set up the municipality to be an attractive place yeah. uh, to come develop. Um, again, the, the bylaw is really just, uh, these two documents are meant to give some predictability and clarity. And oftentimes, with, as you have predictability and clarity, it becomes a more attractive place to come and, and, and look to develop. And I honestly think you've done a great job oh, of great. that as well. Great. And I know like a lot of the people that you've met with in communities and all that, they yeah. were they were very happy because they 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 believed that you people were actually listening to what they were telling them. Oh, and good. I think a lot of it reflects in a lot of what came out here on great. paper. Glad yeah. to hear. Thank you. Would it be an idea to get somebody from, I don't know, the environment department or somebody that knows more about these buffers and what they do to sh show the council maybe a, a different, their perspective compared to, I mean, I, I don't know, I'm just throwing this out to have a presentation from somebody on the other side of the home. To I, I don't know. You know? Yeah, I agree. Like, well, the Nova Scotia Department of Environment's got very clear regulations on what you're allowed and not allowed to do when it yeah. comes to the waterfront. Yeah. And, and basically, it's they just don't have a vegetation buffer zone that, that's being enforced province wide, yeah. unless it's for industry, like I said, logging, mining, yeah. some agriculture that's applications, yeah. but not. But not to address housing in cottage country, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So generally, that the province does look to the municipalities to, to set the rules for those. And because it yeah. probably can't be enforced very really good. Mm -hmm. Well, it'd be something for us. I guess we're the document in front of us, and we certainly have some more time sure. to speak on it. So yes. And we can. We can. I can go back, and we can provide Alan and Lori some um, a little bit more information on that. Uh, are we only speaking at the moment on the uh, on the natural shoreline protection? Well, I do or, or have do another. You want, or do you have one more presentation? I make? have I have another slide that I okay. I think so I'll wait for some of my questions, and then I will open it up. Okay, very good. That's great. Is, Did you have anything on that? Only on the enforcement. So it, it is. Uh, so what what would happen from a practical perspective if you were to agree to the riparian riparian uh, twenty five foot? is any development subsequent to the time that the land use would come in play, um, there would likely be some form of, of permitting that would occur at the time of the construction. So there would be obviously information that would be uh, shared with the developer and, um, and, and the rules associated with that. Uh, anybody who has, and, and please correct me <laughs> if I go astray. So. Sure. Um, anybody who has an existing boat shop, like not a boat shop, like a boat house sure. yep. or, or uh, associated um, construction within that 20 foot uh, area would be considered a grandfathered, uh, grandfathered in, meaning they could remain in that location provided that they didn't make any substantial uh, changes to that particular yep. building. Yep. So, um, and obviously anything major would likely require a, a building permit Correct. from our end yeah. if it was already constructed. Um, in in uh, new construction in that in that zone, uh, the only question I, I had was what would happen um, six months down the road if we were to pass this law and I buy a lakefront property and I want to put a boat house, not a boat house, but a, uh, wharf. a wharf or, or some, yeah, so, so we'll talk a little bit maybe about wharf yeah. Um, and then there's also sometimes uh, people have like boat houses, and I don't mean residential boat houses. Mm -hmm. I mean to house boats, not not humans. Mm -hmm. um, so 
because uh, sometimes it, it gets to that. That's right. Like suddenly sure, there's another yeah. L or a layer and suddenly sure. somebody's living in there. So, sure. um, so what would happen in the instance of a wharf and what would it happen in the instance of a boathouse without humans? Sure. So um, the, the intent of the riparian buffer is to protect uh, the existing vegetation as, as much as possible. Um, so wharves, we have written, oh, oh dear, uh, there's a pop up here, is there? <laughs> we'll get our expert on the, yeah, yeah, expert on the job on here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do have written into this clause that um, in, water course, uh, in, in the watercourse buffer area, the natural flora and fauna is to remain substantially undisturbed except for penetrations for wharfs and boat launches. So those two items are allowed to, to be permitted into the 25 foot zone. And then you are allowed to do some moderate thinning of tree, of tree cover to enable, to enable views. Other than that, um, what this clause is is requiring is that the vegetation and uh, the trees and brush stay where they are. And again, that is to protect the the water course stream and the habitat that's in there. Uh, so wharves and boat launches are permitted within that buffer. A boat house likely wouldn't be allowed in that in that 25 foot. So you'd have to move back 25 feet. What about a pontoon plane? A plane with pontoons, could they have a, a, a would that fit in the, in the picture or if they want to pull their plane up? So a lot of, I know some people on the lakes yes. have some planes. That's right. What would happen there? Um, that be permitted or not real? Well, I guess, uh, <clears throat> could you call it a boat launch? I, I, I guess it would be up to staff's discretion. The, the, the yeah. clause is there. I mean, they, there could be changes to the clause. That's why we're here. That's why I'm here I'll today. So um, if, if we felt, or council felt, that that was an appropriate uh, use into the riparian zone, as long as it didn't, I guess the intent of the riparian zone is to try to keep what's there, there, to keep the integrity of that water course and the, and the habitat that's in there. Seems to be such a challenge yeah. that yeah. I know what you're saying on that ra yeah. riparian, but on the other side we want development and that. Sure. Oh, it's one, one heck of a toss up there. Sure. Yeah. yeah. No. And I guess I will say that this, like I've said before, it is on the very much lower end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in other municipalities, it has not restricted development. They're very, yeah. there's very much water. Water, or properties that have little streams in it that the whole back half has, is, is taken out because you have to respect a 30 meter buffer. Um, so it's, it, yeah, I guess that's all, that's all I'll say, that it is on the lower end and in other municipalities it has deterred um, property so, value. Sometimes it's easier to seek, uh, seek uh, or beg forgiveness than to seek permission. <laughs> That's not what I was saying. Cool. <laughs> yes, the So when it comes to wharf and boat launches, that would be uh, up to the provincial government, Department of Environment, to allow that to go ahead, and the municipality to allow it through the buffer zone, right? So if they were, even if they thought they might be able to get permits, we would have to open up the doorway first for them to go through the flowers and trees to, yeah. to get to the waterfront. Well, Is but that how I understand it? So, assuming you're doing an as of right development and you're not going through the back and forth of, of development agreements, boat, boat launches and wharves are as of right with the municipality. Really? So, the, the doors are open in that yeah. respect. Um, so, I guess when you come in to get your permits, as Alain said, um, you'll, you're expected to submit a site plan and those site plans will have, are expected to have that 25 foot buffer zone shown. Um, and staff will look, and uh, the, the, presumably the wharf will also be on your site plan, and, and that's the way this is written, that, that's acceptable. But we can't approve wharfs and boat launches. That has to go to the province. Yes, so, yeah. so any, any sort of, yeah, I, I'm not ultimately that familiar with the approval process of, of natural resources or province, whatever, but uh, w I guess what we're saying is if you wanted to add a boat launch, you can do that as of right, even within the 25 foot zone. So we wouldn't, there wouldn't be a requirement for us to approve a boat launch because it's already allowed. 
um, or a wharf. Now, if the Department of Environment or Natural Resources had a problem with how a particular resident was doing that, then obviously they'd have an issue with them. But we would not. We allow that even within the 25 foot rule yes. with foliage, et cetera, whatever you want to call it, um, you, can, you can put a boat launch in uh, under these new rules. Uh, and you wouldn't have to show that in the initial development. You could do it later. Most people don't necessarily build a wharf right away when they do a lakefront property. So they wouldn't even allow, ha have to ask us to do that because it is allowed uh, under the rules despite the riparian regulations. Is that, is that okay? Is that correct? Okay. And just to come back to Alain's comment on the structures that are current are currently built in the that riparian buffer zone. Um, so assuming this bylaw passes and is adopted and approved by the minister, uh, so those those property or those structures that are currently there, they would be permitted. Uh, they would not be allowed to be expanded upon. Uh, within the 25 foot buffer. If for whatever reason the structure comes down, um, whether it gets swept away in a flood or it burns down, uh, if it's a, a structure for residential purposes, then it can be rebuilt. If it's a structure for commercial purposes, it can't be. And that, that those, those requirements come from that the MGA from the province, from the Municipal Government Act. So they deal with these, these items are what we call non-conforming uses. So they are one time legal, but then rules have changed and now they're not legal, but they're still allowed because they're non-conforming. Um, so yeah, those just for a little bit more insight on this. Okay, no further questions, uh, uh, Anne, you can sure. proceed. Uh, cannabis production and processing facilities. I believe there was some discussion or maybe some questions on, on this type of use. Um, so here I've just clipped where we hmm. are permitting cannabis production facilities. We have two types of facilities. We have the micro and the standard. Uh, so micro is small scale production and standard is, is I guess, the larger scale. Um, so we are in the, all the industrial zones as well as the rural development um, area. We are permitting micro uh, production as of right. Uh, once you get into the more residential or the sp maybe smaller lots or more uh, densely populated areas, then the, these facilities need to go through the DA process. And then the large scale uh, production facilities are permitted in the in where you see here in the heavy industrial in coastal communities in the coastal communities industrial and rural development and these ha must go through development agreements so staff will have their say PAC will get to review and council can will also get to review and I just put a picture up here to show you what these production facilities could look like uh, so on the far right is I guess what would be a standard facility. So from the outside, it really doesn't look like much. Um, and then on the inside, this is what, uh, these are called Delta 9 pods, and it's what the can ha where the cannabis is grown. So they're in these contained um, pods, the smell and odors are, are contained. I mean, the federal government has their standards of how these production facilities need to be, be built. Um, so, so what you see on the right would be the standard type of facility, and in these pods, uh, the micro facilities might have one, maybe two of these pods. So from the outside, the building could look like any old building, um, uh, but it would have these, these small pods in them. So that's just kind of a FYI. The, between the micro uh, processing and the standard processing, is it the number of plants that are allowed uh, in there, or what? How is that determined as to what's micro and what's? So we put we put definitions of both in okay. the the new land use bylaw, and let me see if I can look at that. Pardon me. It does it does quantify the number of plants. Yeah. Um, Uh, and I believe, I actually, I believe I'm looking at the, um, I'm looking at the definitions and I think we're defaulting to what the federal government, like the federal government is qualified, yeah, qualified.
quantifies as a, or qualifies as a micro and a standard. So the definition, just so you know, that, so I'm just looking at micro, it means a facility which is licensed under a micro cultivation and or micro processing license by the government of Canada, uh, where cannabis products are grown and or produced or processed or stored for medical or recreational use. So um, what micro is or what is not is, is uh, regulated by the federal government. But it would be smaller scale. Like I said, it would be one or two of those pots. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We'll wait for questions at the end of the presentation. I have a yes, clarification. No, it's correction actually. Oh, okay. Oh. Yes. Sorry. The micro uh, is 200 square meters. It has to do with size, the area, okay. and, and not the amount of plants. Okay. Because you can actually grow plants uh, in the lateral, right. uh, yeah. uh, as opposed to just the square footage. Uh, so the Be micro different. is 200 square meters, approximately 2,100 square feet. Okay. That's what you're allowed. After that, it's standard and industrial. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I know you would know that. You. <laughs> you're involved. Yeah, thank so, you. So, 2,100 square feet is not a very large uh, square footage, and that's why the regulations are far more favorable for a micro in multiple locations than it would be under a standard. Yeah. That's, that's the and reason. I, I, I can assure you, if I may, sure. yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. that the process of, uh, of uh, acquiring a license through Health Canada is very, very rigorous. I know this from experience working now since June of last year okay. to get a license, and I'm still at it. For a micro or a standard? For a micro. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay. Is there something not given on a piece of beer? No, no. Not at all. It's not like it was university. No, no. <laughs> Thank you. Keep on going then. So I guess that's all I had for the cannabis. Uh, I don't know if there were any other comments. Maybe there weren't comments on this. Oh, keep on going. Oh, I'm sorry, did I have something? No, very quickly. I mean, you're, you're accustomed, fortunately or unfortunately, with a development agreement. Um, <laughs> recently, uh, you had to deal with one. So, uh, and so what happens with the development agreement is, is that it's, it's a specific agreement between the municipality and the applicant. And so they have to meet certain criteria so basically, you identify the nuisances that might apply in this particular situation, and you make sure that the applicant uh, does their very best to mitigate all of the nuisances uh, to an appropriate level. Mitigate and eliminate are two different words. There, are, right. With anything that you do, uh, there, there might be something uh, that causes annoyance to a neighbor. Um, it's, it's not the elimination. Is that That's not your... your uh, that's not your goal. Your goal is to, is to manage to the, the nuisances, potential nuisances that would occur. Uh, this particular industry has a has a bit of a of a history of 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 smell, and so but but the way that it's done in this method, it's like it's like a room within a room. So it's it's a much different uh, development than my, that what may have occurred prior to it becoming legal. Uh, so so I just, I want, it's, it's important to say that out loud and to understand that this is, we're not just willy-nilly allowing this. I mean, this is a very regimented, uh, regulated industry. And, um, and so uh, it's important to make sure that those watching and, and for you around, it, it's that, that, that it is a development that is, has, has managed to mitigate a lot of the nuisances that you would traditionally see in other industries. And obviously, we've had somebody come to this to this council about a, a smell, and you know, a, year, a few years back or five years ago, I remember, three yes. or four years ago. Yeah, that was a person had come in, and there was quite a nuisance smell. The smell. Yeah, that was an exterior grow. That's right, it was. Um, yeah. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, Anne. Uh, so I guess opening, those are the two that I, I thought might come up, um, but if there are other areas that you'd like to discuss or ask questions, I'll do my best. I have, let me start, uh, the lumens of light for dark skies. 
So I'm not looking for your lumens, your numbers. If somebody has a, a light that's really re reflecting on a place that's doing, has an observatory, let's say, if I want to put one in Threads Island, and somebody has a, a this light that's been out there for a while, what does this mean with this new bylaw that that light would have to go, or would they go by, would they be grandfathered in? Uh, so that would be, so assuming there's no light regulations now in the current bylaw and it would be built today, yeah. then you'd have to go with the, what's in effect right now. So if there's no lighting regulations and someone wanted to get their permit for today, then, then, and then in six months time, this becomes in effect, then that would be a, a non-conforming. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions that you may have? I have another one. Okay. So, uh, uh, the, uh, will there be a public piece to, I saw you had the Morris Island. Uh, in Morris Island, there was a piece of land for a boat shop. And I'm the counselor from down that end, and there have been quite a few phone calls, good or bad, whatever, Sorry. doesn't matter. So, will there be a public because that, since you were doing this bylaw, or, or this MPS and MUB, uh, those were added on. So will there be a public piece? Because I told the people, when this comes up, there would be a public piece that I understood from our uh, yep. from public works. So does this still mean there will be a public piece? Or on, these, yeah. or on this one? So that, that change is part of this draft document. And these draft... The, both documents in their entirety. Uh, I believe the plan, Alain, correct me if I'm wrong, is to motion to council to have a public meeting or do a little, uh, do more public consultation uh, prior to the, the adoption process. Um, so since those particular sites that we have included in the rezoning are part of this package, then, that, then there is opportunity to to present this change and collect feedback on this change. Sure, yeah. So if the residents have something to say, they can certainly come at this. Sure, yeah. And so and yes, and that was what I had told them. Yep. But I didn't think these, these four or five you've had, they were going to be. Oh, no, yeah. There, but that's well, okay. And it depends on how you want to run the open house. So yeah. generally, it comes with a presentation, similar to what I just did. Um, and then you can. If you choose, if you want to flag these individual pieces, a lot of times municipalities will do that um, with bylaw changes. Any site-specific changes that are being included, they'll they'll pull them out and highlight them out, and there'll be opportunity. Yeah. So just we we plan we plan on having cer certainly there's a public hearing that has to yeah. that has to happen, yes. which is on your second reading. So on, at that time at the meeting. Yes. you'll have the opportunity, the, the residents will have the opportunity yeah. to come in and, and make comment. Great. Prior to that, which we're, we haven't landed on a date, but it's, it'll be the end of March, okay. um, we will be having a bit of an open house uh, concept. Um, yeah. So we haven't really aligned everything yet yeah. around yeah. that. And but you know, it is typical. It costs a little bit more money. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> it, is, it is typical for... Um, for municipalities to, to pull out those site-specific amendments, though. Yeah. 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 To and highlight those. Identify them. Yeah. And talk specifically to them. So we won't, it would never be our intention to kind of blend them with everything. Or bury them. Yes. yes. No. It's yeah, just the, con the convenience yeah. no, no, no. of going through yeah. the public um, discussion yeah. and not having to do it four, five, six times every time you make a change. We're really just trying to clean it up there. Sure. So, yeah. makes, makes and, sense. and if there's controversy, they'll yeah. have, yeah. in yeah. conflict or disagreement, they'll have their opportunity. Sure, that's all they ask. Yeah. Yeah. The people are asking. Yeah. Any other questions that anybody may have? If not, Ed? Okay. Thank well, you. Um, this one. I do. This have, I do have one. I guess just one more slide, just to get a little, again, yeah. a little FYI uh, yeah, for sure. next steps yes. for you. Um, so tonight we've I've got um, a bit of uh, some things to follow up with you on. I'll provide Alan and Lori uh, some material to circulate on the benefits of riparian buffers, just so that you're a little bit more informed on what they do. Um, I will I'm gonna I will take your feedback tonight and, and see what adjustments are needed. 
so after tonight, um, I believe, yeah, so we'll make edits to the document and then the formal engagement process can then begin. Um, so any additional public participation, if uh, motion by council, so it sounds like an open house is on the agenda, uh, we'll begin. The docu these documents also need to be provided to the neighboring CAOs um, and they need to be given a couple weeks to review. Uh, then first reading of the documents are done by you. Uh, then two notices of, uh, two notices have to be put out for the public hearing and they have to be done two consecutive weeks of, uh, prior to the hearing. Um, and an important note, thing to note that this is kind of a weird thing that the, um, that happens from the province, but as soon as that first public notice is put out, then the municipality is in this weird flux where any applications that come in have to meet both sets of bylaws. Mm. And, um, and to do a, a, another, th I'm dealing with a case in Halifax right now, in order to get your development grandfathered on before the, the new development comes in, or the new bylaw comes in, uh, they need to have both their development permit and building permit in hand. Otherwise, they have to meet this new set of bylaws. So something to note and to tell any constituents you have that might want to get fast track the permitting. Uh, so as soon as this first notice comes out, then the two documents are legally binding. Uh, then the public hearing and second reading will happen. Um, and then assuming council approves, the documents get submitted for ministerial approval. And then the minister has 90 days for review. Uh, and then a formal notice of approval will then be published in the newspaper and a new set of documents. So just doesn't have my eye. That's great. Well, I guess if anything else comes up, um, I guess I'm going to look at Elan, collect an, Elan or Lori to collect any questions or comments. Um, and you can certainly contact me, but thank good. you again for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's certainly very informative. Good. good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Um, a lot to digest. But, uh, <laughs> it's a lot. Mr. Chair, uh, I don't know, perhaps the PAC members may have some questions. Thank you. Oh, yes. It might be a good opportunity now. Okay. Yep. PAC member, do you have any, from the PAC, any questions to further? Okay. I had uh, one comment that I wanted to make when I was reading through uh, the, the report, accident report. It was something that I think as uh, citizens in this area, we take salt marshes as a negative in our community, mostly the smell, the bubble, the mosquitoes, and so on. However, uh, if I was going one time with my family to Mahone Bay and I picked up a book and it said there were 100 interesting places to visit in Nova Scotia, and one, I thought I was losing my eyesight it said the pristine salt marshes of Suez Island. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knew, you know? <laughs> but really, to some people, if you look at the eco, eco tourism and so on, the flora, the fauna, uh, if if there, we're spending money as a as a municipality, for example, for recreation during the summer, which is great, we're getting students to do that. Can we have students hired to study our salt marshes to give us a heads up as far as tourism? That was a question I had. Thank you. Great point. Great point. Okay, very good then. We can certainly move, uh, if there's no other questions, we can certainly move, uh, move to the next item on the agenda. Thank you, uh, Anne. Thank you. Okay, uh, number four, we have adoption of the minutes. Under A, special council meeting minutes, February 24, 2020. So moved. So moved. So moved. Second. And seconded. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 My name, motion carried. Adoption of the minutes of B, committee of the home meeting minutes, February 25th, so 2020. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? If 
not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Nay, motion carried. Number five, business arising from the minutes by the annual tax bill information. We have one attachment. And I certainly would like to pass this on to the CAO. Staff was asked to uh, bring some information, and uh, certainly they have. And I'd like to ask the CAO, maybe you could comment. It's quite self explanatory, but for the public. Sure. Uh, so this was a, uh, a request for, uh, I guess, notice of motion to bring some information to council. Uh, we can certainly double down on this. I just, we, we started with a to you and, and if, if you would still like to continue um, a further investigation we're happy to do that so this was in regarding uh, biannual or twice a year tax billing uh, so we we did a quick scan across uh, the county uh, it, we excluded the towns because the towns do a lot of quarterly bill billing for for water services etc so they're a little bit unique but if you look at the rules um, uh, we went. We looked from Digby to Shelburne, and there were two two municipalities that did that did the two billing system. Uh, Barrington and Digby would be the two. Uh, the the way that they do that is typically they do 50% of the new assessment value. So that your bill, whatever they don't at the time they send the first bill is usually in April. The budget isn't approved yet typically. So 50% of your bill with the new assessment rate and the old rate the old um, tax rate uh, gets billed. And so you have the opportunity to pay that, obviously, and uh, there's usually a deadline to pay that, and if you don't pay it by a certain deadline, you start paying interest. And then there's a second invoice, typically in September or October, which would be the remaining 50% of the bill, including any adjustment to the residential or commercial rate uh, that would occur, because at that point, obviously, they would know the rate, and then, again, they would have another couple of months to pay it. And then, of course, interest would accrue on that second invoice as well. How we do it is we typically do it in late May, early June, and we give uh, the residents to the end of July to pay that 100% bill. Um, we cited, we looked into the cost to do, to send out tax bills once a year. Uh, we, we do that and it costs us approximately $12,500. Most of that is postage, um, you know, probably nine-ish <coughs> postage, right? uh, um, perhaps a bit more, uh, perhaps over over nine. I don't, I don't have a breakdown in front of me. So uh, the printing itself is not particularly expensive. The postage certainly is. Uh, we currently outsource the service to Queen's Printing in Dartmouth. We send them a file and they print it and they put it in the mail. So the disadvantage of that is is they would not collate. They would not associate Calvin Donthermo's bill. Uh, with Calvin Dothramo's bill, with Calvin Dothramo's bill at the same address. Yeah. They would just be sent separately. You'd get three bills. Yeah. Uh, if we did it internally, which is what we're looking at right now, you might, you might only get one en envelope, which obviously saves, saves yeah. some money. Uh, we do get a very good deal on the printing, which is why we, we, uh, we use that service up until now. So um, we don't want that cost twice. Uh, mm -hmm. clearly so we we have typically not recommended a two bill system um, however uh, I think what we can do as, as a as an organization is take a look at doing an e-bill or a, a more electronic version of the bill which of course would reduce uh, the postage um, altogether and you could literally send a bill every month if you wished uh, a reminder uh, invoice or, or email invoice to your to your uh, to your residents. Obviously, that would take a long time to get all of the appropriate emails. You would not get 100% emails, so others would still receive their bill by mail. Um, and some may always receive it by mail. So there is a program that we use. Program, Procom is the name of the program that allows this to happen using the emails for billing, but it's in very early stages. So our hope would be as staff would, would that we would move to an email system rather than a two bill system however if if council wishes to to uh to do a two billing system for for other reasons that we haven't raised certainly we're happy to entertain any sort of comment or questions around that is there anywhere else that they do e-billing yes there are quite a few municipalities that do e-billing um some of them use the software that that we use and they're experiencing a little bit of hiccups 
Um, uh, there are others that use a customized program to do it um, with varying levels of success. Um, we think it is the way to go for sure, but we're just a little hesitant on the software um, at this time. We'd like to see the software automatically either send an email, email or, or trigger a bill on a, mm -hmm. on a run. Right? That would be the ideal situation. Uh, but we're certainly not there yet. We need the internet first. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. One file. One file at a time. Right. Yeah. That one was probably first. So. Uh, so that's the update on that. And and if you. Yeah. Yes, I was the one that brought this up, and I'm completely satisfied with the with the the information you brought back to us to stick with one. So I I don't think we need to. Mm -hmm go any further on yeah. this file, leave it as is, and yep. when we get settled in and better technology in our new building, and future councils can decide what they want to do in the future. That's right, absolutely. I appreciate that, Councillor, but uh, the only other thing I would add to that is, is that uh, many residents still don't know that they can get on a monthly payment plan with us, so, um, so you can do that as residents if you wish to make a monthly payment as opposed to making the larger payment. And you can choose the amount uh, that, you, that you pay us on a monthly payment provided that you're not on any sort of like arrears of over two years that you typically would just make an arrangement. So are they charged interest when they do a, they, a yearly, like a monthly plan? Yes, there would be interest, depending on, depending on when they started paying. So what would happen is, is um, they would, any outstanding balance would still attract 16% interest divided by 12 per month. Um, s s those that get on the plan typically will make a significant payment on, and then they will get on a monthly plan. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so what will happen is they're paying slightly in advance. Uh, that's, that's good for us, not so good mm -hmm. for the resident, uh, but, uh, uh, but they wouldn't be charged interest if they did that, mm -hmm. right? And it would just flow. So it's an option. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay, it's good. Okay, so we'll move on. I guess it's been kind of a consensus. We stick to what we've got and with some uh, some staff looking at maybe some other options as we move forward. Okay, Council's report. Uh, Council Dignan, would you mind if I start with you? No. I don't want to put you on the spot. You don't, you don't worry about putting me on the spot. <laughs> no, you think thank, so? thank you. Thank you. I attended a Mariner Center board meeting and a regional emergency measures operations meeting. Uh, went for breakfast at the Old Argyler for a fundraiser for a walking trail at the Nikhil Home for, for the Nikhil Home for Special Care. Uh, it was well attended. And also attended a wild game supper in Quinnan that went over very well. And hats off to all, all the volunteers that do a great job of this event every year. And that's very good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I went to the Yarm Industrial Commission. I attended the uh, Recreation Department. I attended the um, audit uh, course that we had, which was very good. Uh, gave us a, a brush up of what we have to look for when it, for the audit committee, which was it was a three and a half hour uh, course, which was a lot of information, but it was good information for us that are on the audit committee. And uh, we met with Chris Dantremont as well, which yes. was a very good uh, meeting. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Bort. Councillor Dons. Uh Well, I attended several things Kathy attended, so I won't repeat that. And the only other thing I'd like to mention, I, I remembered the breakfast at Nikhil after it was over. That's <laughs> why I wasn't there. So I apologize for that. And we had another... Uh, a Bucktick uh, festival meeting. There seems to be, it's been always popular, but there even seems to be more more uh, interest in the community uh, based on two or three people really getting people stimulated. So uh, schedule's pretty well set. Things are a go again for this summer. Exact dates haven't been set yet, but generally late July. This would be uh, number, you remember? Oh God, it's still I shouldn't five. have asked you that. <laughs> It's over 30, I'm thinking it's over 30, 30 I figured, yeah, yeah, that's right. Councillor Albright? Uh, I also attended the recreation meeting, and just the highlights, I guess, um, Wayne Hubbard, the, the maintenance, our maintenance person, gave a presentation 
of basically all the work that he's done in our municipality and it's unbelievable it took an hour he showed pictures and what's been done and, and we had set priorities for what we wanted to do in the municipality and we've met them all like we're really with Wayne it's been unbelievable what's what he's been able to accomplish um, also we talked about trails uh, at the recreation meeting we talked about the Nikhil trail and they're just for information they're looking at implementing a trail kind of a link from Echo Belleville to the Belleville rails to trails so that students can easily and safely access that trail as well that's that's coming uh, attended the Nikhil meeting where we talked about the trail there as well they're looking for funding for grants things like that for that phase one of that trail um, they've hired a new director of care we talked about that as well and fundraisers and I missed the fundraiser on because I was sick I missed the wild game supper because I was sick um, unfortunately I also attended a splash pad meeting um, all three councils have now I guess I don't know if the right word is approved the location but um, have all agreed for to the location so right now the splash pad committee is really active in starting subcommittees for promotion of the of the splash pad and looking for uh, funding and they've got a pretty active committee they've got some really good ideas going fire department meeting for Eelbrook um, they've hired project manager Ian Everett to help them out with their with their fire hall plans um, to help get them on the right track and they're looking for funding opportunities as well um, just want to give a shout out to uh, the play that was at the theater on the weekend um, that was it was excellent uh, it was called the grandchild and it was done by local people and it was very very good I think that's everything and yeah. Chris Dottermo and yeah Thank you, Councillor Albright. Councillor Uh I attended some of the, the meetings and, and things that were already mentioned. The, uh, the fundraiser at the Argyle for Nikhil, I showed up and didn't have any money. And so thank you, Councillor Digden, for, for borrowing 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> any time. <Yeah>. Uh, <laughs> and uh, also uh, attended uh, on Friday, March 6th, we had a demonstration at the West Pamico sewer plant for the new... Uh, Dewatering machine, the Trident MD, and uh, so we had Hans and uh, Von Dantremo, who's the, the operator there, uh, demonstrate uh, how the machine worked. And so far, uh, the initial tests have been good, but there's still some more testing to be done. Uh, this is just a, a small scale machine, uh, basically used for you know demonstration purposes. So uh, it uh, the, you know the results were looked okay, but again, there's still some some work to be done there. So. Thank you, Councillor Dartremo, and I'll just pitch in then that I, most of the places that you've mentioned, Industrial Commission, Chris Dartremo, the play, like Nico said, was just one of the better ones I've been, yeah. you know. And uh, I also did the uh, CIFA interview on the, uh, on the radio uh, uh, about the building and a few other things they had. They had a day for interviews, and Danny was there also. Our warden, so it was a uh, yeah, it was okay. Okay, we'll move on. Number seven, warden's report. It's there. If you have any questions, we'll wait till next meeting to corner room. Uh, staff number eight, staff report. Uh, Alain, I'd like to pass that on to you quickly. Sure. Um, just uh, the first thing I'd like to say is, as the grants to organizations online application system is now online. Um, you can uh, make an application in, in both uh, English or French, uh, whatever your preference is as an organization. Um, it's, a, it's a new program, so I'm sure there'll be a couple of hiccups. I did have a, a, a quick conversation with uh, one of the applicants, and uh, he was super good and asked some really good questions and said, well, you know, it worked pretty good, but, you know, Sometimes the person doing the application messes up, and so you can't blame that on the software. So it was it, so far we're 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 very pleased with the feedback we've received. I'm sure we will get some suggestions to change for next year, and we'll certainly consider that as well. Uh, the application is very easy to do comparatively. Uh, just one other comment I would say is that the the, the organizations don't have to repeat, repeat, repeat what they're doing every year, right? So. I, I think of the Abuptic Festival. I mean, every year, typically, they'd have to tell us this is year number or whatever of the Abuptic Festival. So we know what the Abuptic Festival is. 
uh, we know what they do, and so uh, we've tried to streamline the application to make it convenient for those that consistently do things for our community. Uh, the admin building uh, is on the agenda for, I, I don't think there's a decision to make, but I will give some guidance in terms of where we're at uh, to the best that I can. Uh, rural intranet, um, there's just some information on that uh, regarding um, what the next steps will be and when the next funding will be announced, which is uh, supposed, to, supposed, supposed to be in um, summer of this uh, current year. Uh, now that does not, that's for the developed Nova Scotia money, that is not for CRTC. CRTC, I'm not sure when they'll make any sort of decision, but I know that certain internet service providers that provide internet services in Argyle have applied and they have identified um, some locations for for that and the thing with CRTC is you can only apply for the locations that CRTC says are under serviced so they don't fund a bunch of additions so, so whoever the ISP is the internet service provider is they they will strategically kind of place a project together based on the opportunities they have um, so uh, inter the airport corporation met yesterday. Uh, we did uh, present a report which was accepted by the board regarding what the costs might be regarding a, um, uh, an extension of the runway. Um, the, this is clearly not a project that, that is uh, a reality. It's just we, we wanted the, the uh, we received questions around what the costs might be. Uh, from from you know pretty credible uh, locations, so we just wanted to make sure we had that information in case it ever became a project that that had some some credibility and had a business plan and had and had actually f uh, available funds uh, from levels of government. Uh, LEB and MPS, you got the presentation today. Um, I would like to just uh, solidify a couple things when we get into for decision. I know it's not an actual line item, but it's a subsequent to the presentation, we'd like to just clarify a couple things so that we can get council to, to agree on what, we, what the next steps are. Uh, we are um, awaiting uh, announcements. We've applied for money for East Public Water Utility. We're, we've, been, um, we've not received any new information on that at this time. We're deep into budget uh, at this point, and the rest of the uh, report, excuse me, uh, as submitted by the staff is included. For your, uh, if you have any questions or comments, happy to do my best to answer them. Any uh, questions uh, to the CAO? Any counselors? If uh, not, yeah. yes, go ahead, uh, Councilor Board. I see in the report um, the, the water tank and the, on Willet Road. So, so you're you're able to um, now they know there's a small leak or whatever. You know how much water you need, or how big of a tank you need, or yes, we received a visit, and I think this is actually in Hans's report. Uh, we received a visit from um, some uh, engineers who really were uh, quite amazing. Uh, they really uh, identified uh, what the facility needed. Um, there was a lot of good news. So, so what they said was they they they. they Leakage on the um, on the actual piping is unlikely, um, and they had made some recommendations as to what we could do, uh, both on the Willet Road tank, while we wait for another, and the other work that should happen first. It confirmed a lot of the work that we had already done, like focusing on the wells, mm -hmm. focusing on uh, getting the volume of water moving to a higher level. Um, they also told us that some of the some of the, the data that's being collected, maybe there's inconsistencies in how it's being collected. So where we thought there might have been a leak, there actually is unlikely to be a leak based on imperial versus metric and all sorts of conversion things that I don't understand, but certainly Hans does. Anyway, so it was very, it was actually very positive. More positive, um, more positive than what we were, were seeing in some of the previous reports. And, and so the, pr the practical solution around, around it, it, it feels a lot more affordable. Uh, we don't have solid numbers uh, on all of it just yet. But it did confirm our, that, that what we're doing now is, is what we should be doing. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Any other questions to the CAO? If not, do we usually uh, do a motion to accept that? I don't know that we usually do. You can. Yes. I think a motion to accept the report is, 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 is in order. Yeah, yeah, I think it would yeah. be appropriate. Also move. Any discussion? Not. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 It nay, motion carry. And we'll now move on to um, council priorities. And the five priorities are there. Looking at the airport downsizing, it's uh, the first part is 85% done, which is the renegotiation of multi year agreement with the town of Yarmouth, the municipality of Yarmouth. The other parts, I guess, the closure of the runway, and that was still. Uh, still on hold. Uh, council priorities, this would be the Mariner Center expansion. We've certainly moved, I guess, to about to the limit we can on that part until we get funding. We've got the uh, we developed the shared vision. We invested to forty thousand dollars consulting, established the project expenses, and we established a long term funding agreement. So I guess we're, we've got that done and it's just the operations part that we're on hold. So I guess that's where we're at. Uh, I'll ask the CEO if he's got any comments after, after I'm breathing but in any time. I feel alternative and affording ha afford affordable housing. That's going according to this very well. 100% uh, on the development award, the public road tender that's been done. A request for proposal for Development of affordable housing. We've got 80% of that done. Review the land use bylaw, which we've, we're wor working on that part today, of course, as you see. So, the award the project development to succeed to successful RFP, that's still at zero, and that'll be. We're going to take our time in doing that part. Next is the new municipal administration building. We've got that on the agenda <coughs> under under the in Canberra Park. We do, we've, we've had tenders come in and that's what we'll be discussing in Canberra. So that's certainly moving, everything's moved forward except I guess the phase, initiate the phase on land, on land improvements, including uh, repurpose of the existing building. And that's all in the, uh, that's all in, in our, in our uh, tender, I guess. Next one is the Hillbrook Fire Department and that's, as we've been explained, moving very slowly. Uh, we've got 50% done on the ensure that construction considers a comfort center needs, including generator, public shower, public access, and non-potable water. The other part for our uh, uh, percentage in the, in the sharing, that's still on, that hasn't moved any further because they're, they're, they're not obviously moving, but, it, but it's an ongoing thing. Uh, next, I'll have, you don't have anything to add on there. That's okay. We'll move on to, uh, where am I here? Just a sec. For decision, information sharing agreement, elections in Nova Scotia. Re reading that, I guess it's a, uh, the information sharing agreement with elections in Nova Scotia, they need our permission by the due date the date to expire right now is April the 1st, and that's to, so they can, and if I understand that right, if we can, we have to have this agreement in place for us to get the uh, election, uh, the uh, the list of electors. Correct. That's what that is. So uh, we need to approve this prior to April the 1st. So if you've all read it and somebody is willing, has questions or would like to make a motion on that, it would be appropriate at this time. I so move. Second. So moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Mary right name, motion carried. Again, for decision, regional agreements and structural reform conversation. There's no attachments to that. No. Say, I'm useful, you have something. You know? Just uh, an update. This was a notice of motion or that was presented at the day of when we did the uh, the conversation on, on consolidation and, and, and uh, so I, I put it on the agenda I don't have any information on this at this time so we can we can 
if, if council isn't prepared to have this conversation right now, that's completely fine. We can put it under uh, business arising and leave it there. Yes. Um, I, my recommendation would be that prior to having conversations with, uh, with our partners, we probably should sit amongst ourselves and take a look at the agreements that we have in place, mm -hmm. understand how many there are, um, you know, how long they're lasting, et cetera. So kind of get an understanding, a strong understanding of where all of those are. Um, I think that the work to um, modify that is, is likely going to be in the interest of all three parties. Mm -hmm. um, but how it gets modified, we first need yeah. to be informed internally. So um, I think that uh, my recommendation would be to push this a little further ahead um, into the Table. late spring. Um, you know, not necessarily before, not necessarily wait till the budget's passed, it can be done before that, but I think uh, with, with the tasks at hand, um, I think it would be better if the work occurred in April or even, uh, even into May at this point. Uh, how obviously we will do some preparatory work for you. And so we, I left it on the agenda only to, to uh, you know, if anybody had additional comments based on that last meeting, then this yep. this or another meeting would, would be the right place to do it. Yep, you've got it. I think it seems I saw the heads nodding that we're all in agreement that this can move, you know, in the, like you said, prior to the budgets. I think I think it would be better, in my opinion, that something comes up before the fall, for sure, in the spring, because it's kind of a hot topic and in our mind right now. And certainly, from what we heard from the CAOs, you know, very frustrated over some things, yes. So if you can bring more information, uh, I think it'd be good to, to, you know, for our next meeting down the road. So, okay, we'll move from there. A letter of support for the municipality of Barrington bid for the 2021 axe throwing competition. It was an attachment of four pages. And... Uh, I, I didn't I didn't see I, I read the, the the whole thing there was no, no suggestions of any letter there but but certainly the heading on our agenda says they will be looking a letter for a letter of support although the I didn't see anything in the four pages asking for that so th th that would be the request that yeah that, that was the request that they you know yeah. yes go ahead. I can make that a motion. We have two wax throwers right now in municipality. That would be yeah. the and opinion. It's a great event. So. Yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really nice. I went to the last of the head and bear. Did you? And, yeah, and it was really fun and, and uh, very entertaining. And, and, and it was, it was people, five. Yeah, it was fun. It was, uh, okay. it was very nice. Yeah, it was really good. I even watched it on TSN the other night. Yeah. Is that wrong? There you go. It works out. So we have a motion moved by Councilor Dawson, awesome. seconded by Councilor Book. Uh, any uh, further discussion? If not, uh, all, uh, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 By name, motion carried. <coughs> okay. Uh, administration building tender. And I would prefer if you would look sure. over that, please. So it's just a memo to council and staff to provide an update on where we are. Uh, you know, we're all very accustomed to, uh, we're accustomed to seeing a tender and it happening fairly quickly, right? Uh, the complexity of this tender um, means it takes a little longer, I guess. So what I can say is uh, the deadline for tenders for the, has has come and gone. The contract that we tendered for, just so that everybody's clear, is it includes the landscaping, uh, parking, paving, uh, the building, including the movement of the old home and converting it into uh, storage. The contract doesn't include the engineering or architectural fees, or nor does it include the solar panels uh, or the public or the public road. The public road is is completed, with the exception of a, a section that will be paved. The entire public road won't be paved at this time, only a section. Uh, so the next step in the process is for the architects to receive more information on those bids. They did receive that information as of the one o'clock today. 
um, and all three um, submitted information uh, the way that they that they were required. So we, I can confirm we have received three bids, and I can also confirm that the three bids are qualified bids. So at this point, uh, we have not yet confirmed with the low bidder that they are the low bidder. So that information is still not public information because the, the bidder should be the first to know. Uh, they that first that that organization will will know between today and tomorrow. Probably they may even know now. Um, so the uh, once that information is made uh, known. Uh, what happens is the contract gets negotiated. So the price that the lowest bidder put in is not necessarily the final number. Uh, uh, according to the rules, you can sit and, and have a conversation with that organization and they tell you, you know, here's the, here are the things that we saw, here are the things that can be adjusted. So you can negotiate with the lowest tender. Only down? Um, you can negotiate up as well, okay. uh, provided two things occur. Uh, one is within your budget, right? So you can you can change some of the things that you said that you were going to do, uh, as long as it's within the budget that was approved by council. Um, and and obviously they, you can negotiate up if you choose to increase your budget. So but you'd have to make that a motion. So what will happen is the engine the architects will meet with this particular organization. They'll have a conversation. I will be a part of that meeting. And we'll have a conversation about what changes may or may not be suitable. And then that information will be brought to you. Um, uh, and so that meeting is slated for early next week. The information regarding uh, making it public as to who was the lowest bidder will occur before that. You, we, we won't wait until that meeting because the, the, the bid the bid is a qualified bid. Okay, so um, uh, look, if we were, I guess what I can say is, if 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 the figures were way out of whack, we wouldn't be having this type of conversation. Um, so that should be positive, at least taken in some way, positive news at this time. Yep. There are some other pieces of information that I would share with you in camera, so that you can be aware uh, of where we are. Um, but you know. There's a there's a slight smile on my face. I don't like to smile too much, too much. Uh, but that's where we are in the process. So the process has actually taken longer than I thought it would, and so I I, I apologize for that uh, because I think I told you I would tell you before now. So that's where we're at on the on that. The uh, there was some uh, I've heard some to the grapevine, good source that said usually one of the bidders said uh, usually uh, when the tender is open. You know right away. You most and, and just for bigger jobs than what was tendered here, and they found it. You know that they hadn't heard anything as of Friday. You were really surprised. That's, you know, but that's a, it's a fair comment. And, you know, they're used to seeing it, but we, we and it's in, within our legal rights to make sure they have qualified bids, right? That they both they all qualified. It's within our yeah. It's in the tender document, I would think. Yeah. Well, and the bidders. Um, the bidders were all very aware that they had to submit a second piece of information by today. So they knew that it wasn't entirely completed, although the significant portion would have been completed on the 4th of March. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, I think that uh, the communication around that is, within, is between the architect and, and, and the, the bidders. So. We, we haven't been, we've been asking politely, but we haven't been directly involved. I have one more question, it was, would be, what was looking on your, on your um, what you wrote, uh, does that mean that the solar panels and the, the geothermal, well, because it's, whatever they give us for a price, it was that firm for six months, will they have to retender and do the whole thing over again, which, or what they've already, Put in a year ago, is that still? So the issue with the solar panels is yeah. that the company that had the lowest bid is no longer doing that business. Right. So yes. that tender is done. So we'll have to re-tender. We have all okay. the specs. We, I mean, there might be some 
there, there will be some work uh, with our electrical engineers uh, to, to draw up to make sure the drawings are appropriate. Um, but the good news is, is, is photovoltaic technology is, is typically uh, going down in terms of cost, and so uh, it, it, we are reasonably confident that the bids will be, will be as good as they were a year and a half ago. That was another question. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, and we don't expect it to delay anything in any way. Thank you. Any further questions to uh, CAO? If I don't see any, so we'll move from there. And uh, for correspondence and for information, library funding update. Didn't we have a tank? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Kathy. I got on my page and on my computer. My apologies, Nicole. Nicole, you have post office boxes. Yes. I don't get it. Excuse me. I probably would have gone right through. So I had a request come through. Um, our community mailboxes are in Tusket by where that tree's in is. And at night, it's quite dark there. And I've had some complaints about some residents not feeling um, safe getting out of their vehicles, uh, potentially going to get their mail at night. I know myself, I've had, if I go at night, I drive my car, I face the mailboxes and put on my high beams to see, because it's hard to see. And honestly, for me, it's, I'm afraid there's bugs or something in there that I'm not going to see. Um, there is, there's very little lighting uh, in winter time too. You can't always see the ice that's there. So I'm just not sure, is it, is that Canada Post's responsibility or is that TIR? I'm not sure whose responsibility that is. So I guess that's kind of where I was looking for some, some direction as to, if we if we could find out who whose responsibility it is and do we send a letter? I'm not quite sure. I know where they put the community mailboxes home. They put them where there was lighting. Okay. But like church parking lot, they put it right underneath the the light post. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another place I forget exactly. Where. I know that they've been trying to put them where there's lighting and parking. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean the restaurant is there yeah. and there are businesses, mm -hmm. but at nighttime it's it is dark. It's gotta be. It's gotta be. It very is. Dark. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, I can tell you that any plowing that's done is through the Canada Post. Okay. It is because I do some plowing. Mm -hmm. and so I, I, I'm 95% 90, 90, sure. So it would be, I would think it would be Canada Post? Yes. I would think. Yeah. So can I make a motion that we send, send a letter that. to yeah. Canada Post sure. requesting, yeah. requesting some lighting potentially sure. for that yeah, location? Certainly. Yes. Okay. I'll second that motion. Okay. Right on. Moved by uh, Nicole, seconded by Councillor Dayton. Any questions or any, any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 nay. Motion carried. Thank you. Right. Well, if you if you just as an add on, I have uh, some info on the lady to speak to that I do on plowing. Uh, so I yes. could give you the name, phone Great. number, name, and everything. That will help. Yeah. Uh, tell my cough. Is there Okay. We'll, we'll take that yeah. for sure. Thank you, Nicole, for bringing that up. It's a great, great point. Uh, for correspondence and information, we have the library funding update. Uh, plenty of attachments on that one. I was appalled to see how much has gone up in the last in the last year. So Seventy, seventy, some odd thousand dollars. Uh, the on that, yes, yeah, very good. Sorry, sorry. It's okay. Um, it is correspondence and for information, but it could easily have been under decision. But yes, um, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what happened. The province, yes. the province through communities, CCH communities, culture and heritage, was uh, negotiated a um, an increase in library funding with the libraries, the associated libraries, and a variety of of different people were uh, <clears throat> part of that. So um, we are responsible for approximately 10% of the Western County's regional library um, budget. So municipalities share in, in that cost and we're at about 10%. It is different across Nova Scotia I, I, and I'm not sure why it's different, but it is, there's individual agreements, et cetera. So, uh, so anyway, that, that being said, um, we were not consulted. I remember that. During that process, uh, not the NSFM, not AMA, not any municipal unit was part of the conversation. 
So it was like other parties had a conversation about how the municipalities are going to obviously back into an agreement to fund something that the province had agreed upon with its uh, with its libraries. Now, no, and, and this is not a commentary on whether they deserve more funding or not. This is a process that was completely breached. Uh, we received a one-year notice for uh, increases in costs, but we were, again, not consulted. We're not even... We're, we're, we're more than just a collaborator on this. We're a funding partner. So it would be like the Western Wren negotiating an increase in funding and not including Argyle mm -hmm. and saying, well, we just decided on an increase in you know, the municipality of Barrington and Clare and everybody else agreed, but not Argyle. So, I mean, I think probably we'd collectively flip our lid if that happened. But for some reason, uh, this is allowable, which is, it's, it is not, it should not be, but it, it's where it is. So the, the correspondence <coughs> that we received from the deputy minister of that department says, here is the increase that the province is committed to make. Because the municipalities were not given appropriate notice, they make a suggested, they, it's, I guess you're, you're being volunteered to increase your library funding. Uh, there are some municipalities that will likely agree to an increase in funding to the Western Counties Regional Library or other uh, library or associations across Nova Scotia. Um, uh, the AMA had a conversation about this at our most recent meeting. The NSFM will be responding to this. Um, it's, it's, it's appalling that they would put that out in that way and ask us to voluntarily uh, do this. They missed the process. They never, they never uh, included us in the process. And now, and um, this, this is perhaps a little bit more my own personal opinion than, than, than anything else, um, they are guilting the municipal units to individually um, look at the situation as a voluntary um, uh, contribution. This goes completely against the process that we have an MOU with the NSFM and, all, and the province of Nova Scotia that is a signed MOU with two organizations. It's not about whether the, the library deserves the funding or not. It is that the process was not used, we were not respected in the process, and now we're being asked to consider a funding increase on a voluntary basis. So I realize that uh, that that uh, you know we we are we have board members on the Western County Region we have a board member uh, on the, the Western County's Regional Library um, raising it here you are being asked to consider this um, you don't have to make a decision at, in this meeting if you want more information bring it back for a decision uh, or have, the staff is happy to do that for you if you want to wait to see what the NSFM position is I'm happy to to bring that information to you as soon as possible. Um, at this point, you don't have to make a decision here. It is in for information um, for that very mm -hmm. reason. Yeah. Now, clearly, if you want to increase it voluntarily, you could do that tonight. Yeah. But, uh, um, but I, would, I would caution against that because you have to look at your whole budget and take right. a look at what that means. And if we just say, sure, then, then what else will be downloaded? And sure, yeah. then what else, right? That's right. Great point. Well, I'd much rather wait to see what the NSFM comes up right. with it, and then go as a unified voice, mm -hmm. you know, instead of start chipping away mm -hmm. at different councils and that. And, well, they done it, so why can't you right. people do it? So you you would have thought, uh, Alain, you would have thought that seeing the mistake they've made, and they know they've made a mistake, you know, on this, you should never even have come to this, you know. Give, putting this on our lap, you, thought, you would have thought they would have come up and said, we have certainly not uh, honored the process, and we are, the funding is the same as it was last year, and, you know, we'll send you to the MOU uh, a letter, you know, or something like that. you think they would have backed off, but no. Well, They're making they, us feel guilty. They, they didn't, and this was sent to, this was sent to the municipalities. There was, there was no consultation with the NSFM. Yeah. prior to this mm -hmm. going out either. So right. so there was there's still no there's an ongoing lack of consultation there, between right. this particular mm -hmm. department and, and the and the municipal organization that is supposed to represent all of you. So, yeah. so I think uh, hearing mm -hmm. from everybody we'll wait and see what our budget looks like in uh, 
and we gave them the NSFM also. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, the other part, the um, DMA, Department of Municipal Affairs, uh, DMAH, business plan, 11, attachment 11 pages. Under C, we have Cook Agriculture. This is, yes, go ahead. The only thing I'd like to say about this Cook Aquaculture, the attachments they sent us, and um, I've seen some stuff on social media here the past week and a half uh, that reflected with the Argyle Council and a lot of us as councillors. The only thing I'd like to say to people that's putting stuff on social media, I know a lot of uh, these... Um, aquaculture uh, plans are near and dear to people's heart and you've got your pro and you've got your people against it but please if you're going to put stuff on social media get the facts straight when you're talking about counselors or council that's the only thing I'd like you know these people that's putting it on mm -hmm. and that the please get their facts straight instead of getting a pile of people on social media upset uh, by um, r rumors, I guess I should say, and that would be the best way to buy rumors. So let's get the facts straight before we, they they uh, say that the municipality of Argyle done this or the municipality of Argyle done, said that. And that's as far as I'll go with that one this evening. And Thank I can you. add to that. Uh, I, I think people, there's, there's assumptions that are made uh, and, you know, um, According to social media, uh, Cook Agriculture was coming here tonight and doing a presentation. What? Uh, but there was, did, they, did they approach the municipality? Did they contact the municipality of any kind for a presentation? No. No. Okay. Just wanted to make sure yeah. that was clear. So. Yeah, exactly. Very yeah. Clear. And I mean, it was, it's, it's on our agenda. I think somebody probably saw it on the agenda, mm -hmm. thought it was a presentation, uh, made some assumptions. And was you know started rumors. Started rumors and was totally wrong. Oh, I get you. So uh, anyway, you. great points brought up. If yeah. if, uh, if, if yes. Charlene the Blanc, community development officer, was here today, what she would tell you is our waters are not adequate for fin fish aquaculture, and uh, and so um, while there might be opportunities for fin fish aquaculture in other regions, um, our focus with uh, our focus has been and continues to be. Um, oyster farming related um, and and the ADA that we would have signed with the province of Nova Scotia was for oyster leases uh, all within the the, uh, the the legal confines of, of the province and federal government so there's been no discussion locally about uh, uh, open pens or fin fish uh, aquaculture opportunities in our garden. Uh, there, there, there may be in the future conversations about, you know, um, aquaculture operations that that may involve fin fish, but if, but but it would not be anything that wouldn't have a, a tremendous amount of transparency. Exactly. So up to this point, we really haven't had any discussion of note. Um, we would certainly not enter anything without a huge heaping of transparency. And by no means are we trying to do anything behind our residents, no. mm -hmm. you no. know, back or nothing like that no. with Cook Aquaculture or any company yeah. as far as I know of. Yeah. Yeah. And we do, we fish. do already have an established uh, fin fish operation uh, right. in, in Abbas Arbor, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. That's right? So it's not like it's new to us, but, yeah. uh, you know. Great, great right. point. Thank you. Yeah. That's right, the trout. Yeah. Okay, under D, 11D, we have Epilepsy Association Purple Ribbon Campaign. And uh, Warden Muse not being here, uh, I was asked by Kim if I would say a, a few words on this. Do we, do we still do proclamations? Uh, so before I read this, I want to be sure that uh, I know that the flag raising, years ago we stopped raising flags for every organization in the you know that uh, it's not. What about proclamations? And did we not? Do you remember? I, I can't remember. We said we weren't going to do because we have to do it for everybody. Or 
Do you uh, remember a little Our bit? recent practice is not to actually pass a proclamation, um, okay. but we have obviously, um, you know, be it, uh, you know, for our Veterans and Remembrance Day or for epilepsy as we are all wearing our ribbons today or, or other events, we have shown our support in other ways. It's there is there is nothing that says that you cannot okay. uh, do a proclamation. Um, I think we were at some point getting many, many, many requests. I remember. And, and so that has since changed quite a bit. So it's entirely up to you. Okay, I'll read the, uh, thank you for that clarification. Uh, Purple Day proclamation template. Whereas Purple Day is a global effort dedicated to promoting epilepsy awareness in countries around the world, and whereas Epilepsy is one of the most common neuro neurological conditions estimated to affect over 15 million people worldwide, and 42 people in Canada are diagnosed every day. And whereas one in 10 persons will have at least one seizure during his or her lifetime, and whereas the public is often unable to recognize common seizure types or how to respond with appropriate first aid, and whereas Purple Day will be celebrated on March 26th annually to increase understanding, reduce stigma, and improve the quality of life for people with epilepsy throughout the country and globally. Now, therefore, I do hereby proclaim March 26, 2020, Purple Day in an effect, <coughs> effort to raise awareness of epilepsy in Canada. So I guess if, I would certainly like if there was a motion and a second. 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 Seconded by Calvin. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 My name, motion carried. And for a reminder, we did do it last year. And our IT person, Scott, they wanted pictures, took pictures of some of us with the purple ribbons they right? want. And I forwarded the pictures on. They wanted it for their campaign. Oh, very good. So. Thank you. Uh, good memory. Good memory. Holy smoke, Ben, you're good. You know uh, when you got a problem when you start forgetting passwords. <laughs> <laughs> gotta write them all down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and we have under 11E the uh, Art Recreation Commission uh, meeting minutes. Uh, F, Western uh, Ren CEO report. Attachment five pages. You can have that as your reading pleasure. The YCDTA final report, and that is Yarmouth County Trail Development Association. So that, that's there available for us to read. There's a lot of money being spent on that part, for sure. Uh, okay, we'll go to financial request, and we have a uh, uh, grant, and I think Councillor Albright. Yes. I'd like to make a motion that we give $500 in district grant to the Eelbrook Fire uh, Fire Department. They are looking for some new equipment. I was at their meeting, they were talking about ordering new um, the mannequins for CPR. Mm -hmm. They're very, very lifelike. And they're a total cost of $734.55, so the $500 would take a big chunk out of it for them. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. My name, motion carried. And we have a 12B, uh, Councillor Dick. Yes, I'd like to make a motion that we give $500 to the new role of the reason. The Le Berini, uh, that's a seniors club in Pubnico, and they'd like $500 to help with uh, pay for the rent, the building that they're in. Mm -hmm. Second. Make that a motion. And I did. Seconded yes. by Councilor Brook. All those in favor, say divide by saying aye. 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 My name, motion carried. Okay, we'll go on to agenda topics for next meeting. No motions, any councillor have something, if they do. If not, we'll proceed to a uh, question period. Anything from the media or on... Okay. Or uh, Alex, Facebook. So we're going to take a break first. I'll let Alan have, have a look. Yeah. How long is in camera? Uh, in camera will be about, well, it depends on how, how long you want it to be. Five minutes? <laughs> I, know, I know you want it to be probably 15 minutes or less. It might be 15 minutes or less. 
Yeah. It's not my call. It's no, no. Chairman's no. call. No, no, it's okay. Okay, nothing from the questions. Uh, uh, we'll need a motion to go in camera. Motion to go in camera. Moved by Councillor Bork. Seconder. Second. Second by Councillor Albright. All those in favor, signify by saying no. aye. 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 Nay. Motion carried. And we'll take a few minutes break if the media has any questions or certain. We'll move from there.